Good morning, everybody. Would lo love for you to take out your worship folders and a pen and kind of follow along today. We're in a series called The Fruit of Christ's Character. Our main text for the last several weeks has been Galatians 5.22 to this point. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Folks, we've been spending some extended time in this passage of Galatians because inherent within these words is the expectation, or we could even say the promise of the gospel, that there will be change, that there will be transformation in our lives. And what we've been studying and trying to unpack together in Galatians chapter 5 is Scripture's explanation of what that transformation should look like, of how that change or transformation should make itself evident in our lives. And this is a, it's a big deal. A good definition for the biblical concept of transformation, this is on your outlines, is to change in character or condition. To change a thing into a different thing. So let me ask, how much changing has been happening in your life lately? Are you, are you different today than you were the day before you accepted Christ? Now, please hear what I'm asking. I'm not asking if you believe or you understand some things differently than you once did. I'm asking, are you different today than you were a year ago? Are you different today than you were a month ago? Because the expectation or the promise of the gospel is that there will be change, that there will be a continual transformation in our lives as long as we walk with him. Romans 8, 28 through 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good, God's good, of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? For those God for knew he also predestined, he planned ahead of time, he intended for us to be conformed to the image of his son. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that's the backdrop, okay? In view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, and pleasing to God. Give your life, live your life fully unto him. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be squeezed into the world's thinking or the world's mold or the world's habit, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. Now that's fundamentally what we've been looking at in this series in the fruit of the Spirit. Ways that we who walk with Jesus are expected to change in our lives. And so far we've looked at love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and today, goodness, by the time we get done with this series, you're going to be able to rattle those right off, you know? Now, I, I, there's, a, there's a good chance I'm wrong. But I got a feeling that when we look at this list of Christ-like characteristics that God wants to develop in us, that goodness, it's probably not the one that got us the most excited, you know? You look down that list... You didn't go, woo-wee, we're going to talk about goodness. And it's not that we got anything against goodness. It's just that goodness has kind of got the reputation of being kind of uh, vanilla. You know what I mean? It's, it's not bad. It's just not that exciting. And what I'd like to suggest today is that take or that understanding of biblical goodness might be more than just a little misinformed. Goodness. 
When I was a little kid, I spent the majority of my days before school, after school, during the summer, over at my grandmother's home because both of my parents worked. And there were multiple times when my grandma would leave, grocery shopping, hair appointment, back then a hair appointment took all day, you know, grocery shopping, hair appointment, and the like, for an extended period. And her last words going out the door were always something like, now, be good while I'm gone. Now, what was... What was her expectation when she laid those words on me while she was headed out the door? Was I supposed to, you know, like go across the street and mow the yard of the senior citizen who lived over there? Was the expectation that I would go up and down the block collecting money and clothes, you know, for the the needy and the poor? No. I just wasn't supposed to catch the house on fire or anything, you know? The truth is... That she generally, when she left, I was watching TV. And when she came back, I was watching TV. In other words, I had been good the whole time by essentially doing not much of anything except causing no harm. Is that our understanding of what good is? Oh, he's a... He's a good guy, you know. Mostly stay out of trouble, not cause a ruckus or a problem. Is that being good? Not biblically. One commentary says of the word translated goodness in our passage in Galatians 5.22. This word provides a clear sense of an active, even aggressive goodness. Another has a closer examination of its use in the scriptures reveals a word indicating zealous activity in doing good. Again, biblical goodness is always, under every circumstance, beneficial. It reaches outside of itself for the good, for the benefit of the other. William Barclay writes, agathusene, that's our, our word in the original language, is therefore active, even, here it is again, even aggressive goodness. Then he goes on to say, the English word goodness includes many pleasing qualities, whereas the Greek word indicates one particular quality. It is more than an excellence of character. It is character energized, expressing itself in active good. Part of our problem is that we don't have one English word that's sufficient to translate it. It can mean, especially in the New Testament, merciful and kind. It can mean righteous or moral excellence. But in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, it was used primarily of God and used primarily to describe God's essential nature. In fact, in the Old Testament, it was believed that God alone is good. Now that ought to ring with some of you because Jesus echoed that very same thought in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, when he said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. What is it that you're saying when you call me good? And yet here in Galatians 5, Paul says we should expect to see this goodness, the the kind of goodness that describes the very character and nature of God coming to be expressed as part of the very nature of our lives. Can you hear that? No one is good except God alone. Now in Galatians 5, you be good. Now in Galatians 5, God's goodness is now to be a part of your very being, of your transformation and becoming more Christ-like. So let me ask you a really serious question. What changed between the Old Testament and Galatians 5? Jesus. That's what changed. We're talking about the life and death of Jesus that made it possible to be forgiven. We're talking about the resurrection and ascension of Jesus that made it possible for the Holy Spirit to come and now reside, dwell, make his home within us. 
that made it possible for us to receive this gift that Paul once described as a new creature or a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.8 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. We're talking about the power in our lives that can transform us into the image of the God we love, into the likeness of, the, of His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 8. It's now expected that you and I will become good. Now that's God's plan for you and me and everybody else that comes to Jesus. And we have to admit, <laughs> that's a much greater expectation than not causing trouble or just kind of showing up on Sunday a couple times a month. We're, we're, we're talking about a much bigger concept. How does it happen? Simple as answer. By being connected to Jesus. Listen to John 15 verses 4 and 5 where Jesus says, where he promises, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, John, John 15 verse 8. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Bottom line, Jesus says in John 15 that this transformed life happens by remaining connected to the vine. Jesus himself, flat out, you are not going to have the Jesus life unless you have the life of Jesus living in you. But one more time, how does it happen? Gentlemen, I heard Rob Renfro, he broke it down nicely. This is on your outlines. Number one, the life of transformation is a life lived in relationship with Jesus. When Jesus came to the world, he came to change the world. He came to save the world. We know the story, right? To do so, he calls 12 relatively ordinary people, and he's going to so invest and change them so they, in turn, can go out and change the world. But what did he call them to? When he called them, when he called these 12 relatively ordinary people to prepare them to go change the world, what did he call them to? When we look at scripture, we see that he called these 12 relatively ordinary men to come be with him. And then after these 12 relatively ordinary men spent time with him, he sent them into the world to do the same thing with others again and again. Listen. Listen to Jesus' initial call of, this, of these original 12. Mark 1, 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Again, Mark 2, 14, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. So do you see how this plan of transformation occurs? What is emphasized are not rules, not regulations, not rituals. The whole plan to start to change the world begins with a real relationship with Jesus. Everything that they were going to do flows out of their relationship with Jesus. And it is out of that personal relationship with Jesus that the rest beco becomes to follow. Listen to Mark 3, verses 13 and following, as Jesus was sending the 12 out to begin this process of changing the world. Mark 3, beginning with verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him, verse 14. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, 
that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have the authority to drive out demons. And then in verses 16 and 19, he, he gives the names of the 12. Now, a lot of you, 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 you know this. These are what we might call the, the big boys of the early church. Before their lives are over, they're going to convert thousands. They're going to heal the sick. They're going to cast out demons and even in a couple occasions raise the dead. But did you hear where it all began? Did you hear what was most important? That which Jesus first called them to. He appointed 12, designating them apostles that they might be with him. And everything that was going to happen with them, the change in them, the future change in the world, begins with, it is dependent upon their being with him. And that's the way it is with us. Transformation begins when we turn to and stay connected with Jesus. Transformation begins with a relationship with Jesus. Now the second thing builds upon the first, and that's it. Look, it's number two on your outline. It's in our relationship with Jesus that we find the power for transformation. I know you've heard this, but hear it again, please. John, John 15, verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you, wear, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when the, the branch is separated from the vine, the life of the vine is no longer flowing into it. And it begins to die. And it certainly doesn't have the power it needs to produce fruit. And Jesus says that's, that's how it is with us. If you're connected to the vine, to him, good, good. But if you become, if you become disconnected, you're not going to see any fruit. You're not going to see life. What he doesn't say here is, well, you know, you believe in me. You've turned to me, turned to me as Savior. That's enough. That might be enough to get you to heaven. God's grace is as great, we're counting on that God's grace is as great or even bigger than his promise. But it's not enough to see transformation. It's not enough to see the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life. For that to happen, you need to remain connected. Let's consider for a moment an illustration we know from human relationships. Do you remember when you first fell in love? Do you remember what it was like? It's almost intoxicating, you know. And that other person that you've fallen in, in love with, they, they, they become like your whole world. They're all that you think about. Everything that you experience, you want to share with them, you, you want to talk with them, you do talk with them often more than once a day, sometimes for hours. You look forward to spending time. You change priorities so you can spend to got time together with them. They are your everything. And then what happens sometimes? Over time, people get married, things press in, and when we start to have a conversation in that office up here, they're having, they're having problems. What is the typical explanation for what has happened? It goes something like this. Well, I, I, I don't know what happened. We just, we just seem to grow apart. I, I guess we just... I, just, I guess we just quit working at a relationship. We started taking it for granted and... And now we're distant. And it's in those times that couples get into real trouble. 
It's in those times that they give in to things that they never would have given into if they had continued to work on maintaining their connection. Some of you here can remember what it was like when you first came to faith. When you, when you discovered, and that's what it was for you, a discovery that Jesus loves you and that he came to die for you. Some of you remember when you first learned that real love, it looks like grace. And it's not earned, it's, it's a gift. Some of you remember when it was so hard to wrestle with the idea that God could love you, not just the world, but he could love you like that. And some of you remember what that did for your own heart when you realized it was true. Do you remember? Some of you can remember what it was like when Jesus became more than a name to you and how you loved him back, how he came to be the center of everything, how you wanted to know him and be with him and, and please him. And then, and then... And then time goes by, and things press in, and we kind of quit working at that relationship, taking it for granted, and we wind up distant. And that's when we wind up in trouble. That's when we give in to things that we never would have given into when we were working and investing in that relationship with him. You see, the, the power for transformation comes by being connected with Jesus. So what I want to tell you is that make certain, at least that you've got a daily time with God, that you're going to spend some time, that you're going to invest with him in God's word. And if you're not doing that now, start in the Gospel of John, one chapter a day, it's three minutes to read. And then then pray. Just talk to him about what you read, what you heard him saying to you. Share your heart with him. Talk to him about where you're struggling or where you know you need help. Be real with him. Tell him. Tell him that you want to grow, that you want to learn, that you want to become. But more than that, tell him that you want to grow closer to him, to be like him, or at least that you want to want to grow closer to him and that you need his help later on in the day bring him to work or school as your day goes by stay connected through the day nothing you can do is more important than that if you want to seek real transformation because that connection is where the power is. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity. The Christian is in a different position from other people who are trying to be good. They, speaking of other people, they hope by being good to please God, if there is one, or if they think that there is not, at least they hope to deserve approval from good men. But the Christian thinks that any good he does comes from the Christ life inside him. He does not think God will love us because we are good, but that God will make us good because he loves us. So may I add, if you're not growing, look here first. If, you're, if you find that your love is fading or absent, if you find yourself looking or acting a lot more like those who do not know Christ than, than Christ himself, start here because it's in our relationship with Jesus that we find the power for transformation. And that leads us to our last point today, number three. We become like the one or the ones we spend time with. Have you ever noticed that before? 
My wife and I have been married for over 43 years now, meaning that we've been together for twice as long as we were ever apart. And I got to tell you, some weird things have happened over that time, you know. Some of them are kind of natural, like food preferences. She now likes and even enjoys pizza where she never did before. I now like and enjoy, like really enjoy, coffee, and I never did before. She now watches Westerns with me. That's a big deal, all right? I now watch much of her stuff with her, all right? <laughs> now, none of that's very crazy, but one of the weirdest to me is that for years, when we were first married, I was always hot when we went to bed, and she was always, and I mean always, cold. I'd have a sheet and a fan on me, and she'd have multiple quilts piled up on her, and she still said she was cold. Through the years, we've invested in several of those, those heated blankets where you have dual controls. My side would be off. Often, the blanket would be kicked off of me, and Chris would have hers cranked on high. Somehow, they always shorted out. I, I, I don't know how that happened. And now, now we live in Montana. <laughs> Land of the endless winter, you know? And when it's not winter... We have the air conditioning cranked down low enough that this is serious. I'm not, not pretending or making fun. We have the air conditioning cranked down low enough that we keep blankets available for visitors in all the living areas. I've got a small group that can prove it, all right? We also have multiple fans that blow on both of us at night. And this is the kicker. We have a box fan set up in our bedroom window that blows on us whenever the outside air ranges from the low 60s all the way into the 40s, and sometimes I've been able to cheat into the 30s at night. How did that happen? If you would have told the young me that the day was coming when we were going to have a window fan blowing when it was in the 40s at night, I would not have believed you. But the business of others rubbing off on you, it's not just limited to food choices and some personal preferences. Researchers have been telling us for some time now that couples who stay together for 25 years and more, they even begin to resemble each other. Now, I've got two articles here that I, I'm not going to read them to you. Long and short of it is, the more time that we spend together, we kind of partake of the same things, do the same things, and we start mimicking expressions so that even our wrinkles start looking the same, you know? So that might explain, let's go ahead and go to the slides, please. That might explain why, why people start looking like this, you know? Go ahead, keep on going, just real fast. They could be sisters and brothers. That might explain that, okay? But folks, I don't know how to explain these next slides. All I can say is, go ahead, folks, be really careful who you spend a lot of time with. Go fast. Stop there, all right? Let's be honest. I bet even the dog is embarrassed by this shot, don't you think? <laughs> All right, go ahead and take it off. All I can say, folks, is be careful who you spend a lot of time with. But if we were wise, we wouldn't just be careful who we spend time with. We'd be intentional, wouldn't we? Silly for a moment, no more silly. Whenever we have a child, a teenager, or maybe one who is in his or her early 20s, and all of a sudden, that child winds up in real trouble. Often what we hear, or if it's your child, often what you will hear yourself saying is something like, I don't know what happened. He or she just started hanging out with the wrong people, with the wrong crowd, and now it's like I don't even recognize him. It's like I don't even know her anymore. 
If you ever had a kid end up in that kind of place before, I bet I know what kind of prayer you played. You prayed. Dear Lord, please bring someone into their life that will show them a better way, that will point them back to you. I've prayed that prayer over my kids. I've prayed that prayer or a prayer like it with I don't know how many moms and dads with grandparents over their grandkids, single moms over their kids, praying for a friend or if God would bless some godly man to step in and have some influence. I've prayed with young and middle-aged spouses who see their spouse walking away, being enticed, looking for something better, different, new. And why do we say these things? Why do we pray these prayers? Because we know that the people we know and the people we're around, that they influence us, that they make a difference, whether we want them to or not, whether we realize it or not, just being around people begins to shape us and begins to form us. The same principle is in place when we spend time with Christ, when we spend time with God. In ways we don't even understand, being in his presence, spending time in worship, being in his word, speaking with him, spending time with him in prayer, it just begins to rub off on us. There's a story found in Exodus chapters 33 and 34, which illustrate this well. In Exodus chapter 33, we see that Moses meets God in what was called the tent of meeting. Exodus 33, 11, and there the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And as the passage goes, Moses asked for a blessing. Exodus 33, verse 13. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses is saying, I want to know you. I, I want your favor on me. And that we can't go forward without you. We don't want to go forward without you. And then a little later, kind of like wanting proof that God was going to do as he says, Moses asked God, Exodus 33, verse 18, Now show me your glory. Now listen to what God's response to Moses, what, what his response to Moses' is, bold request to see, to actually witness God's glory before him. Exodus 33, verse 19. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my, catch this, goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name that wasn't even spoken out loud. I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Now, I'm trying to get somewhere in the next chapter, but I couldn't pass this up. In response to Moses asking God to reveal God's glory, his essential being, his Shekinah glory all around him, God answers Moses' request by declaring, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Now you do with that what you want. But it made me stop this week. In a time and age it seems to dismiss and maybe even mock the power of goodness to change or influence anything. It was God's personal goodness that he allowed to be displayed before Moses so that Moses might see and understand something about God's glory. That doesn't seem like a little thing to me. Then we get to the next chapter. Exodus 34, and we see that Moses goes up and he meets, with God, he meets with God on Mount Sinai for an extended time. 
Moses bows in his presence. He worships. He listens. And then on behalf of the people, he asks God to continue to go with him. Now listen to what happened to Moses as he came down the mountain after meeting with God. Exodus 34, beginning with verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware, here we go, that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. Other translations have it. His face shone. And they were afraid to come near him. Moses goes to meet with God, and after meeting with God, after talking, worshiping, spending time with God, it's like some of God's glory, his goodness, his love, his holiness. It's like some of God rubbed off on Moses. Now, if you know the story, you know that the people were freaked out by this glow-in-the-dark version of Moses. They didn't know how to handle this. So Moses would wear a veil to hide his face until he wouldn't speak with God again. But, it, but Paul, in 2 Corinthians 3, he gives us a little more insight. In comparing the new covenant with the old, Paul declares that the radiance of Moses' face would fade over time. As he spent time apart from God, the radiance would fade. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 13, he's talking to the church. And he says, we are not like Moses. We will put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Uh Uh-uh. We're different. Why? What's the difference? 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect God's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, folks, there's a whole lot packed in those couple short verses but the gist of it is because we have been giving the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit because he is with us I quote transforming us into his likeness what's his likeness Galatians 5 22 love joy peace patience kindness goodness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit The evidence of our being with God doesn't have to be this diminishing thing. We become like the one or ones we spend time with. And you and I need to make sure that the primary one of those is our Lord. So, if you want the the power to love difficult people in your lives... If you want the capacity to be patient or long-suffering with those who continually irritate you, to forgive those who have hurt you, to overcome temptation, start by spending time with Jesus so that he might change, transform, or just plain rub off on you and your heart. We become like the one are ones we spend time with. And you and I need to make that one our Lord because he's good in the fullest sense of the word. He is good to you and me. Amen? Pray with me, would you please? Father, I'm asking that you will help us to have this heart that seeks you. Not just knows you or knows of you, but seeks you daily. 
We're asking for the kind of relationship that you've chosen to make possible. We want to come to see more of you in love. We want, we want joy and peace and patience and kind and this, this goodness, this active goodness to be a part of who we are, Lord. Help us to have the heart to seek you in the middle of it. We want to be those who are growing according to your purpose. Lord, please, give us that heart. May we choose you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.